Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome. If you are a first-time visitor today, um, thank you. Welcome for coming. If you're a once-in-a-while visitor, thank you for coming. Uh, we do have parting presents for you at the table on your way out. Please be sure to stop and say hello and pick up a really awesome little flashlight, I think, is in there. Maybe a coffee mug. Lots of good things. You all familiar a little bit with Monty Python? Some of us are in our generation, right? Well, here, time for something completely different. Philatity. Philatity. If you take the word lately and put P-H-I in front of it, it spells philatity. You might think so. Well, that happens to be the collection and study of postage stamps. Bears no relevance at all to the sermon today. I just saw it in my email this morning, and I thought, hmm, maybe I should share that with somebody. Maybe a nice little icebreaker. Well, I'm sure some of you are maybe um, happy to see me. Others are thinking, what's this guy? Where's, where's Pastor Eric? That's who I really came to see. Well, Pastor Eric is spending some time out in Seattle, um, or Seattle area anyway, uh, with his family, with his daughter, and we're very happy for him. I am Pastor Steve, associate pastor here, and... Um, uh, it is my privilege, actually, to be able to preach on occasion. And even though I'm kind of goofy, if anybody who knows me, um, I have also related a little bit more to Eric today. Because oftentimes Eric comes up here and he's suffering from allergies or this and that. And he will give a little disclaimer that he's taken any histamines and who knows where the sermon could end up leading to. Well, I too am on antihistamines today, so who knows what rabbit holes we may fall into during the course of this message, but I'm quite certain that in some portion or some part of the message, it will touch each of you in some fashion that I hope and pray is edifying. We are going into the letter from Paul to the church of Philippi, the Philippians. And this is going to start a series. We just finished up the series on uh, 1 Samuel, which was a fabulous series. I mean, Pastor Eric just did a wonderful job with that. But now we're going into Philippians. And I have to be transparent. A lot of times when I read Paul's letters, it's like, Man, spare me the labor pains, just get to the point. Because he's rather verbose. I can read his introductions and just go, why don't you just say hi, you know? But because his introductions are like this big, right? But they all have purpose and meaning. Now, as we go into a new series, it's real good and real important to have a little idea of the background, right? Have a little idea of the context. We should always look at that when we look at Scripture. It's very dangerous and very bad practice to look at Scripture, just pick out a little something that you might find relevant, and you're taking it out of context, and you can misinterpret it, or you can apply it to the wrong things. Well, we understand more about uh, Paul's missionary journeys when we go back into the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, Acts 16, Paul is making his second missionary journey. He's already completed one. Now he's going out again for his second. And during this mission, he's traveling with Silas. Now, Silas, if you don't know who Silas is, he was a person of importance in the Jerusalem church. And along the way, they pick up Timothy. And, of course, a lot of us are aware of Timothy. We, you know, there's books to him and everything. But this is that missionary journey. And what Paul wants to do, Paul wants to go up into Galatia, and he wants to, like, kind of go over into Asia. But the Spirit intervenes. And the spirit, in the words of Eric, would go, nay, nay, you're not going into Asia. Sparky, go the other way. So they end up going the other way, and they end up in Troas, which is along the coast. And he has a vision. Paul has a dream. He has a vision of somebody calling to him to Macedonia, which is what we know as Greece. So they get on a ship, and they go across the Aegean, and they end up at Philippi. Philippi is a Roman colony, and it's a leading city of that district. 
However, as Paul's tradition, he normally goes to the synagogue first, doesn't he? And preaches to the Jews at the synagogue. But there is no synagogue in the, in the city of Philippi. Apparently, according to what I researched, it takes 10 male members to form a synagogue. And they didn't have that. And what they would do is, the Jews there were gathering along the riverside. And Paul comes upon them. And when he comes upon them, he comes to a person by the name, a woman by the name of Lydia, which we might be familiar with. A woman of influence. So they're coming and going. And then one day, there is a female slave who was possessed by a spirit, and she predicted the future. And she earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Well, this woman, this fortune teller, starts pestering Paul and pestering Paul and pestering Paul. Nag, nag, nag. Finally, she exhausts Paul's patience and Paul reaches right into his bag of tricks and he de-demonizes the woman. Now, you might think, wow, that's great, right? Well, it was. It was certainly for her. But the guy who owned her, who was making a lot of money off her, was none too pleased about this. Their cash cow just stopped giving milk. So they dragged Paul and Silas in front of the magistrate, all riled up. And they stripped Paul and Silas and beat the tar out of them, throw them in a Roman jail, put them in stocks. And life all of a sudden is really not going too good for them. Adversity, yep, I think that fits the title. They are facing some extreme adversity. And what are they doing there? They're singing. They're giving praise to God for the circumstances. And then, during the night, there's a great earthquake. Do you remember that part of the story? There's a great earthquake. And, and the jail cells are all open and chains are breaking. And the Roman guard comes to find out, oh my gosh, you know, everybody escaped and he's ready to kill himself. Paul calls out, yo, don't do that. It's good. We're all in here, right? Don't do that. It's good, right? And the guy is so overwhelmed by the experience. And the Holy Spirit touches him and converts him and his family to Jesus. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. And that raises the question or poses the question, is there anything magnetic about our Christian lives that draws people to it in such a fashion? Maybe not so biblically, maybe not so dramatically, but is there? Or do people just see us maybe as a nice person going about our business? Should they not see Christ through us? Do others see Christ through us? Before we break the ice and dive into Philippians, a little background there for you. Before we break the ice and go in there, I want to pass along a couple of things that I want us to consider as we go through not only the message today, but through the series. Are we all familiar with the spirit, I mean the fruit of the spirit that we get out of Galatians 5, 22 and 23? Right. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are we all familiar with the importance of abiding in Christ? And we pull from John 15, verse 5, that tells us, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit apart from me, you can do nothing. In that passage, if you remain in me is also in different translations, the word abiding. And that means to continue, to stay, to remain. Not part-time. Not once a day. Not once a week. Remain. Abide in the Lord every day, through the day, and in the evening. Abiding in the vine means remaining in the Lord, receiving and believing and trusting in the words of Jesus, having an ongoing, intimate relationship with him. It means receiving the love of Jesus 
for the Father and for his people and the joy that Jesus has in the Father and in us. It means sharing the joy, sharing the love, and the words of Jesus. Now, the reason I mention these things is that Paul exemplifies these traits in remarkable ways throughout all of his missionary journeys, throughout pretty much all of his ministry. And we're going to see some great examples of it here. And so as Pastor Eric might do in his surfer dude talk, let's dive in. Surf's up. Embracing joy. Philippians, letters from Paul. Living with God in control. Point number one, thanksgiving and prayer. And I will start going through the, through the passages here with you. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is addressing basically everyone at the church of Philippi. Note that he identifies himself as a servant of Christ. Is this not a mindset that most of us could improve on? on a daily basis? Do we embark, do we leave our day, do we go about our day with purpose and intention of being a servant to our Lord and Savior? It's good that we do. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Straight away, Paul is expressing thankfulness for the church at Philippi and for the support that they provided to him throughout his ministry. They provided him finances. They provided him materials. Um, they just supported him in so very many ways. And now, and, and by the way, from the time he started this church until the time he's writing this letter, about 10 years has passed because he's writing this letter to them. Excuse me, he's writing that letter to them from a Roman prison in Rome. So this is about 10 years later that all this is, is transpiring. Also note the reference here to joy, a fruit of the Spirit. I continue, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The, this phrase of scripture is frequently heard and rightfully so. Why? Because of the assuring encouragement to us when we grow weary, when we feel like we just are, are running into a wall, that we've fallen off of the tracks. Take heart. He does not forsake us. He does not give us up. He will see it to completion. Paul is saying that he is confident not only of what God has done for the reader in forgiving their sins, but also for what he has done in them. Work here refers to God's activity in saving his salvation. Day of Christ refers to his return when salvation will be brought to completion. As it is God who initiates salvation, who continues it, and who will one day bring it to consummation. Moving forward. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you. Since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel. All of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Again we are reading of Paul's thankfulness. And encouragement for the Philippian church. And this is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and insight. So that you may be able to discern what is best. And may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To the glory and praise of God. Here again, Paul is praying for the reader to grow in the Lord and, of course, the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ, which is a product for those who abide in him. As we go about our day, are we being as thankful as we ought? Likewise, are we with intention abiding in Jesus 
He is the vine. We are the branches. Are we praying in the manner that Paul prays for others? Number two, the gospel is preached. I continue in the message. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Paul's detainment in a Roman prison is not for a crime, but for spreading the gospel. And in such, it's actually advancing the gospel and not hindering it. How wonderful is that? And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Without fear. That rings a bell, doesn't it? Have we heard that once, twice, a dozen, 100, 200, 360 something maybe times in scripture? Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Others who share the gospel today are to be encouraged to take the same bold stand as Paul demonstrates and share without fear. I continue. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Even though Paul was being oppressed by the Romans, as well as other believers with bad intentions, he still rose above it all and rejoiced. And this should certainly set a proverbial bar for us. That in the face of the adversity that Paul's getting, not only from his Roman captors, but also from people of proclaiming the gospel, he still sees the truth. He still rises above it. And it's all about Christ. How active are we in sharing the gospel? <coughs> Excuse me. When was the last time you heard someone sharing the gospel outside of church? Or for that matter, when might have been the last time you've heard somebody else ask someone, anyone, if they could pray for them? We need to step up, friends. The truth is, most of us are not sharing the gospel. And it is such a very easy, simple thing to do. You don't have to memorize scripture. If you can and do, wonderful, bless your heart. But you don't have to know a lick of scripture. In fact, when you talk to the unchurched, they don't want to hear you quoting scripture. It doesn't mean much to them. John 3.16 Romans 3, 2, this, that, the other thing. It doesn't mean anything to them. But what does matter is that you can share your own individual experience with someone else. It's not so hard to see someone else in need. It's not so hard to see someone else in adversity. It's not so hard to see other people who have fallen off the track. It's pretty easy to say. Can I pray for you? It is. It's pretty easy to say once you do it. I'm a Christian. Do you know Jesus? And they might say, and I get this all the time. Nope, I'm a Hindu. Yeah. We go on ships. For those of you who don't know much, you know, Patty and I have a ministry. We go on the cruise ships and minister to people from all around the world that come into Port Canaveral. And we talk to Muslims and we talk to Hindus. We haven't got clubbed yet. Asterix. <laughs> Jerry's still out on that one. But what no one can do but you is share your story. 
Each one of us in here who have received Christ as our Lord and Savior has our own unique story. Share it with somebody. In fact, I have a friend who is facing adversity. Big thing, life event, adversity. And during this time, he's at work, and even in the face of adversity, he's smiling. And people are going, how can you smile? I said, that's great. Are you telling him about Jesus? He said, no. Nah, no. I said, oh, man, this is a great opportunity for you. Friends, we have opportunity all the time. Don't put it off. Don't put it off till you write a book. You're not going to write a book. But you can share your, your testimony. You can share it as you go. You will be blessed. The next passage here, and it's not in your notes or on the screen, um, it really almost calls for a whole message just on its own. In fact, there's a lot here that really calls for a message just all on its own, and I need to hurry up because you're all listening too slow. So I, <laughs> so I want to just touch on this because it's important, and I don't want to just skip past it, and it's verse 23. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Now, this little bit of scripture, this passage, provides us a message of what happens when we pass from this world to the next, which is to be in the very presence of the Lord. We don't end up going to Walmart in the parking lot and waiting for the funny bus to come and take us away. No, no. Straight away, as we leave here, we go right into the presence of the Lord. Make no mistake about that. Scripture is very clear. Number three, discipline, unity, fellowship, and joy. See, I've got to hurry up now. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. The verb here, conduct, implies living as a good citizen in a manner worthy of the gospel. Continuing, then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. Paul's encouragement here completes a call for discipline, unity, fellowship, particularly where the gospel is under attack. We as Christians are called to support one another and stand together. We are called to worship corporately. We are called together as we have gathered today. Sure, there's a lot of people that can say, oh, I don't need to go to church. I'm all good. I can just stay home. I can do this. I can do this when I'm out fishing, whatever. But we're called, and that's all well and good, and you can. But we're called to corporate worship. And I'm so thankful that you all have chosen to come today. Very important. Persistent opposition to the church and the gospel is a sure sign of eventual destruction since it involves rejection of the only way of salvation. And don't we see that all around us? In the news, in the schools, in social media, etc. Friends, the world wants to devour us. They want to devour our children. I can't emphasize enough, and I've seen this with neighbors and friends whose children are just being led astray by all of these worldly inputs. And I said, man, don't you take these children to church? Well, we'll wait until they're older. We'll let them decide for themselves. Wait, they'll be devoured by then. We don't stand a chance against the evil forces of this world without Christ, without Jesus and when we have this youth, like we have here in this youth ministry, we have the opportunity to sow the seeds of Christ into them that will never leave them. So whether there are children, whether there are grandchildren, whether there are nieces or nephews, maybe just the kids next door. We had a fellow uh, a, a person here from, from our congregation, beautiful woman, Dolores. She used to sit right back over there. Many of you remember her. 
She first came to the Lord because her neighbors took her. If you see that your family next door maybe is unchurched, don't be afraid to ask. Hey, would little Buffy or little Sparky like to come with us to church? We'd love to have them. Don't be afraid. Be bold. Zip out. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Given as a gift of privilege, Christian suffering, as well as faith, is a blessing. The Christian life is to involve not only believing, but also suffering. And that as counted as joy. Now you might say, Steve, what are you talking about? Suffering is joy? What's your intention? What's your purpose? Are you being persecuted because Christ is through you that others see Christ in you? Count that as joy. That others might see Christ through you. Are we conducting our lives in worthiness of the gospel? Just about at the destination. Every sermon is supposed to have a destination. Here comes the destination. Pay attention. Wake up if you're sleeping over there. Philippians is widely revered as a love letter, full of fruit, full of encouragements, fellowship, and full of stellar examples of living in Christ. Paul lives with God in control and lives joyfully despite the adversity, rejoicing in circumstances prayerfully with thanksgiving. And still shares the good news with others. As most of us here, as adults, we have invited Jesus into our lives as Lord and Savior. Should we not be conducting ourselves likewise? Should we not be bearing fruit of the Spirit? Should we not be abiding in the vine? Not just visiting it, but abiding in Christ? I think so. If there's anyone here today or watching online mesmerized by this wonderful visor that all the proceeds go to the youth ministry, right? We got collars, we got caps, we got visors, we've got it all going on. No picture? Come on, there's a photo op. <laughs> Rabbit hole. Apologies. If there's anyone here or watching online that has not yet, as an adult, received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If there's no someone here that has not chosen to abide in Christ, I'd be honored to talk with you following the service. And I will be out here, not only by myself, boasting time, but with two of our sons, their, daughter, their wives, and our two itty-bitty granddaughters right back yonder in the corner. And they have been so well behaved. <laughs> With that, I invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of being able to embrace having you in control of our lives. Thank you for the good work you're performing in our lives. Thank you that we can look forward with joyful anticipation that you will carry it on to completion. May we all actively, lovingly abide in you and you in us, producing spiritual fruit and glorifying you. May we all be inspired to share the good news, regardless of our circumstances. Lord, please lead us to live lives worthy of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen.